Hello, this is Ray Snow. Today, I want to introduce a very rare interview. This is a talk between Hayao Miyazaki and Shigeru Miyamoto. Miyazaki, who is a skilled animator and animation director and also the founder of Studio Ghibli. And Miyamoto, who is a video game designer who developed Super Mario, Donkey Kong, Legend of Zelda, so once they met and discussed their design philosophy, maybe I can say this is kind of a hidden gem. Even in Japan, not many people know that these two legendary creators met in person and talked before. It sounds very strange considering how popular they are. I always wanted to translate this interview, let's say more than 10 years. You know, it's Miyazaki and Miyamoto. What can you say? So, I was pretty sure that there was an official translation. But, as far as I know, there is not. I guess uh, part of the reason is this magazine doesn't exist anymore. So, let me talk about the premise of this interview. This interview was done in 1992 on a video game magazine called Family Computer Magazine. We called it Famimaga back in the day. So it's a short term for Family Computer Magazine. So Famimaga was one of the most popular video game magazine until Famitsu took the place later. So when this interview was done, Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli just finished the production of Porcoloso and uh, Miyamoto and I think the staff members of Family Computer Magazine saw the movie together, then visited Studio Ghibli to talk with Miyazaki. So, at the beginning of this interview, Miyamoto talked about his impression on Porco Rosso. So anyway, I, uh, so I translated everything and I also want to thank my friend Watabo who helped to review my English translation. As you know, I'm, I'm not an English native, so, so I really appreciate his help. Anyway, enough about talking, so let's start the interview, and I hope you enjoy. I enjoyed the movie. It's kind of hard to explain how or which part of the movie that I liked, but I wasn't bored at all from the beginning to the end. I just watched without thinking much. I liked the simple sequences, such as a flying boat floating on the water. Yeah, it's a simple movie, in a way. I couldn't help but watch the dogfight scenes from a game developer's viewpoint. That sense of speed is difficult to reproduce in video games. I didn't prepare a script for this film. Also, there was no particular message or just a cause that I wanted to express in this film. So, making this was actually a pretty tough and scary experience because I wasn't sure if I could deliver a satisfying conclusion to the audience. In our case, every project starts from random chit-chat. We also don't prepare a script beforehand. Back in the day, when we didn't have many staff members, and the labor standards law wasn't so strict. We often stayed late at the office until around 2 a.m. We would just talk about random ideas and say, okay, let's try that tomorrow. Then we go home. It was always like that. We decided what to do for tomorrow and that made us excited to come back to the office next day. In a way, it was a necessary preparation. But now, that the number of our staff members has increased, I'm a bit concerned because I'm not sure if everyone is looking forward to coming to the office as we used to. But if we work in a team, there are always many kinds of people in it. There are people who can be the core members of the team. There are also people who can support the core members. There are also people who just follow orders, do what they are told to do. The quality of the film is determined by how many core members you can gather. They say 
A project can only be finished when everyone in the team goes all out. But that's not true. There are always people who are not really into the project. When I tell them something, they suddenly start moving their hands or pretend to be working. But when I'm not looking at them, they are slacking off. We call such staff members donkey. But it's only natural. When people get together to do something, there are always all kinds of people. In our industry, there are not many people who have the ability to close development properly. So I'm often worried about ongoing projects because I'm not sure if they can finish the development in the right way. I understand the feeling. I was especially worried when I was making this film. One day, I watched through the film before any sound or voice was added, and I wasn't sure if the ending was satisfying or not. I started to think, no, this story is not concluded at all, and my face turned pale. I went home and lamented, I made a horrible film. <laughs> then I came to the studio next day and watched the film again and thought, wait, maybe this isn't so bad. Then watched it again and, no, this is bad. I was repeating the process. I feel relieved when a game is finally done. When I make a film, I tend to forget what I've already achieved in the project. But things that I wanted to do but couldn't do piled up like accumulated debt on my shoulders. I'm always in such a state of mind when a film is done, and then I go to a lot of interviews in such condition. This is definitely not good for your mental health. What I realized is, I don't think about the audience or how to attract them to movie theaters when I'm making a film. I only think about how to make a film that I can be satisfied with. I have to make a film that gives me a proper sense of closure. In that regard, I have to thank my colleagues. When I don't know where to go, other staff members think for me instead. They ask, did you plan this all along? But to be honest, I really don't know. Sometimes, I really don't know where we will be in the end. It's more like, oh, this looks fun, so let's go this way. I just follow my instincts, and sometimes it spirals out of control. It might sound like an excuse, but recently, I started to think such chaos is also part of the fun, and adds some charm to the game. I think what people try to achieve in animations and video games are different. Video games are a tool, just like a bicycle or a stereo. We so happen to use TV monitors, scripts, and pictures, so people often consider video games in the same production as films or novels. I admit there is a certain level of similarity, but a movie is something you just watch. Even if the quality is not that good, people somehow accept it. If it's a video game, users get bored pretty quick. I'm not a big fan of video games, but sometimes I watch my son play from behind. I tend to cheer for a bad guy that my son is fighting. That's a correct way to enjoy video games. I have no interest in playing video games myself. Even if I play, I lose quickly. I can analyze the situations, like when I'm in danger, or if I fight this enemy, I will lose or something. But even if I could escape from the danger by choosing a correct path, I often find myself not enjoying it so much. I understand what you mean. I think there is a fundamental difference between video games and dramas. If it's a drama, characters don't necessarily choose a correct path. They often try to do something impossible to succeed, even if they know there is no chance. But then, something happens and they somehow make it. In a way, making drama is how to make up a good, convincing lie. After engaging in a dogfight and both pilots leave unharmed, they ended up punching each other. I know this is far from reality, it's very different from video games. So I believe People who like video games are not good at making movies. 
in a way, movies are more diverse than video games. I see it differently. I believe that the current video games are something like what you just described. But if we could push the limits of computers or CD-ROMs, maybe we can make movie-like games in the future. If we could expand on the games that we are trying to make now, maybe we can make novel-like games or interactive movies that users can enjoy for 30 hours. Someone once told me that you can do a lot of things in video games. I didn't know much about video games, but I nonchalantly talked about a game that I wanted to create. It's a story about the Japanese troops during World War II. It takes place when the Japanese forces were nearly wiped out by the US in the South Pacific Ocean. The objective of this game is to board a three-seater torpedo bomber and hit a US aircraft carrier with a torpedo. That said, you can also choose not to get on a bomber. Then what will you do? Maybe you grow vegetables on an island to sustain yourself. Maybe you starve and eventually the war ends. Or maybe you become a prisoner of war and stay in a prison camp until the war is over. Or maybe you die during the process. I see. So there are many choices you can make. You can also test your torpedo before attacking the ship and check if the cock can be removed properly. If you don't test the torpedo, you fail to drop the torpedo or something like that. Or maybe an enemy aircraft flies over. So what to do? You wanna fly over the crowd or fly under the crowd? Since you are on a three-seater bomber, the person in the rear seat is the gunner. You got 47 bullets at the start of the game and already used 30 bullets. You wanna reload it now or do it later? We would make these animated scenes and you need to choose your action before 5 or 10 light indicators turn on. I discussed about making such game. Hmm, I see. I have no idea how many laser discs we need to create a game like that. But anyway, even if someone had said, okay, let's make this game, I don't think we could have done it. The animators would get fed up because they need to redraw similar sequences again and again. I can imagine them quitting one by one. Animators are human and not machine, so we need to think about it when we create something. Lately, people often requested to make a game like that, and I think it is possible to make such games. It's true that people who enjoy video games want to walk on the correct path, but they also want some challenges. When I watch movies, I often feel things go too smoothly, too conveniently. So if I can find a good middle ground between the current games and the movies, it can be an interesting game. For example, when I began drawing the house in Heidi, Girl of the Alps, I would construct a vague image of the house in my head beforehand. Then I start to draw it from the front door's perspective. If you enter the house, a fireplace is there and a chair is here. I draw these objects based on the image in my head. But for a dramatic impact, sometimes we need to draw the house from an unexpected angle, such as from the back of the house. Then I think, wait, how would it look like from the back? When such situations occur, what you need to do is not making up something on the spot, but imagine yourself being in the environment, walking around the house. Then naturally, a visual image comes to you. I think these images are fragments of what you have seen in your past, so it's not entirely your original. In a way, you are sketching things that you have seen somewhere before. So I often feel the image in my head is better than what I'm drawing now. This doesn't look good because I'm bad at sketching images in my head. You could use a computer to handle it. If you use the current technology, you won't need a human's touch to draw things anymore. 
Sometimes I wonder if I should do something like that. A computer game called The Seventh Guest will be released this fall. The developers of this game bought an old house and scanned the whole house to render it as 3D graphics data. Ha, huh, I see. I actually thought about a similar thing. Once you have the graphics data, you just need to use it with a computer. If you want to go upstairs, you just can. You can see the results pretty quickly, because unlike animation, you won't need to draw whenever you go. You first construct a virtual environment and provide it to the users. What would we do in this virtual environment? That's what we are thinking right now. I assume the amount of those graphic data is huge. It took about two years? <laughs> they say it took only half a year, but I know they worked on it for more than a year. It surely takes time, but at least technology-wise, it's no longer impossible. If you imagine creating a lot of events in such environment, it's very exciting. Basically, you can even see the spots that movies usually don't show. I'm very interested in the possibilities that this new technology will bring. When I think about making a fictional environment, I often wonder what the scenery is like. If there is a slope, it contains not only visual and audio information, the smells, what you feel under your feet when you walk on it, your memory attached to it. Scenery is a collective entity of those pieces of information. So, when I draw a slope, I try to deliver such feelings as well. In a way, whether you can do that or not determines whether you are a good animator or not. We call it Kannose, and it is a necessary skill for animators. Maybe you can say the same thing for video game creators. I can totally relate to what you just said. If you could let users feel the touch of the object, even feel the temperature, then users get truly immersed in the environment. It's basically about how to appeal users' five senses by using only visual and audio information. That said, I think such things are easier to be achieved in video games because video games are more interactive. Users can control their characters. Especially nowadays, we can use samplers to create music or sound effects that also helps to appeal users' five senses. So perhaps video games are more interesting media than movies now. I often wonder how to capture the essence of a single tree with a camera. I do a lot of simulations in my head. I even play simulation games in my head, so I don't need to play video games. Well, really? How the tree's roots absorb the water, and how the water flows in the tree. Image of the tree in a scenery, the tree in various seasons. Sometimes a man comes under the tree to take shelter from rain. A bird comes and dies in the tree. How the tree look like when the bird sees it from the sky. I often wonder what kind of pictures you can create if you could move your camera freely and capture all these things. You can do that if you use computer. In the seventh guest, you can move your camera up above a chandelier and see yourself from above, through the chandelier. It's very inspiring. But it cannot be a true scenery unless you capture the wind, the weather, the time, the season, and the operation of the universe. I guess I'm more interested in things such as what kind of clouds are floating above. I wouldn't feel the world is real unless you capture all these elements. But I guess the amount of the data will be massive if you try to do that. <laughs>